Hey everyone, it's Katie and Elisha from NowThatWe'reAFamily.com and we're here to do another book haul for you. Yeah, we're going to be talking about the books that we've read over this last quarter, but really it's been about four months. I write the dates in the front of the books when I finish them, and the first date I have is starting at April 9th, 2023. Wow. What? Yeah, is that? April, May, June. Okay, yeah. July? Yeah, you're right. About oh. almost four months. Three and a half months. So anyways, there, yeah, should we just get started? Yeah, why don't you go first? Because once again, you've got more books than I do that you can. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm spoiled because I do take the kids to the park every day and that is a time that's my reading time. And so I get in a lot of reading hours at the park and then we do read before we go to bed. And also I feel like there's some books in here that we have both read because of our free days. We like to read a lot on free days and Elisha and I both got a free day within this last quarter. Yes. Which has been nice. Okay, so the first one is like the Classical Educator's Bible and that is The Well-Trained Mind. If you're in the classical education space at all, especially like with homeschooling and stuff like that, then you've heard about this book. It The first time I read it, I had a three-year-old and a four-year-old and so it wasn't super applicable and now I mean I still just have a kindergartner and a first grader but it's becoming more and more applicable to me and especially as I as we look ahead to our child's high, our children's high school education and their college education and all that I just really want to be prepared and have a vision so we can cast that vision for our children so they know what our expectations are and where we are headed. I feel like the sooner we can kind of lay those expectations, the better. So anyways, super inspired by this book. Tons and tons and tons of homeschool resources and books and recommendations in here for further study or further resources and curriculum for your kids. And I love her recommendations. Awesome. It's fun. The first one I'm going to bring up is this is the reason why it's been a hard reading quarter for me. It's because of this book right here, and that's Don Quixote by, was it Miguel Cervantes? And this was the book club book of, the, supposed to be the month, but this thing's dragging out. And it's because this thing is so long and it's so hard for me to read. All of our books have been pretty long, but this one, I mean, this one's like 900 pages. How long is this thing? Yeah, almost a thousand pages. Yeah, just under a thousand pages. And I don't think I got the best translation of this one. I forget which translation is the most recommended and I got the second most read, recommended translation. And when I read my buddies who had the most recommended translation, it was much easier and more enjoyable to read than mine. So I think that has a part to play in why this has been so laborious for me, but this has been like 90% of my reading time has gone to this guy. And look, I, I'm not, I can't even claim to have finished it. Still have, I still have more to go, but this it's, it is enjoyable, but I wish I could say that I've enjoyed it more than I actually have. It's a great book, obviously, for so many reasons, but this one's been work for me. So this is why I've my, my reading list is a little smaller this quarter. Yeah, Elisha's books are always very hard and long. Okay, so Fast Like a Girl. So this was April 9th, and this is when I decided I was tired, feeling uncomfortable in pregnancy. And so I got on this big health kick around 20 weeks pregnant, and I started doing intermittent fasting. And so this book is incredible. I would highly recommend it. It's all about the healing powers of fasting. And she talks all about like 12 hour fasts up to 36 hour, 72 hour fast. I would love to do a big fast like that when I'm not pregnant or breastfeeding, but who knows when that day will be. So anyways, this is a really inspirational book and yeah, really inspired me on my health journey. Mm, nice. The Family at Church by Joel Beek. And this one was actually given to me by Luke who works with us. And it's an easy read. And I would say this is a really encouraging book if you already value having your family in the church service with you or you value doing family, or not just family, but like church prayer meetings or church meetings with your family. It's really encouraging. I wouldn't say that it's like a very persuasive book. So if you if you like want to give a book to somebody to show them like the benefits of, you know, having your family in church or maybe a biblical defense or reasoning for having your family in church, I wouldn't recommend this book. But if you're already somebody that's like, man, I want to have my family in church, 
this is a really encouraging book. It takes you kind of through the history of prayer meetings in the church. It, he references the Puritans a lot and talks about their families in church. So it's a really encouraging read and one that, yeah, I'd recommend it to anybody that values having your family in church. Glucose Revolution. This book is phenomenal. You do not need to fast in order to be able to balance your glucose. Something that you notice with in the intermittent fasting space is really what you're looking for is not spiking your glucose. Cause when you spike your glucose, you cannot lose weight while you are in that state while your insulin levels are heightened. So this book gives so many hacks for being able to eat the exact same way, but eat in a different order. So like if you eat your salad first, which is your fibers before you eat your carbohydrates, you'll get up to a 60% less spike in your glucose and insulin. So that's pretty cool. There's all these little hacks. I know I'm using glucose and insulin interchangeably and they're not the same thing, but they often go together. So anyways, this is just an incredible health hack book for like you can enjoy the cookie, but how you enjoy the cookie really makes a big difference and can impact the fat that you're storing and your overall health. So recently I've been making a point to just read instead of do anything else instead of listening to even a podcast or instead of even you know watching a youtube video that i might enjoy i've been trying to see what happens to my brain and my overall well-being if i just read instead of like i said any other media platform and having something like aesop's fables readily available makes that far easier because you know how it is in the middle of the day like when you're going when you're going to the bathroom you don't want to grab don quixote you know you don't want to grab like some deep theological book. I mean, maybe you do, if you do, that's great. But having, having something like Aesop's Fable in the back of the toilet, that's really helpful. You know, cause like you can just read a few of them per sitting. I mean, I don't know what your fiber intake is. So maybe you can get through Don Quixote in an average trip to the bathroom. But the point is, it's nice having these like low hanging fruit reads where you're like, man, I can read an Aesop's Fable. And it, to me, that's far more rejuvenating than any other type of media consumption. Be fun. Okay, going down the health, this is, uh, one of my last health ones for right now. Real Food for Pregnancy. Everyone's heard of this book. Super, super good. Um, but I loved going through and, oh, this was April 2nd. Um, but I just love, again, how she's talking about how protein helps with, you know, lack of swelling or it's like a very practical book. And I wish I'd had this for my first trimester because I think it would have helped a lot with my morning sickness. Um, but she tells you all the supplements that you need to be getting, how you can get them from your food. And for me, it was really helpful because I do supplement very heavily to be like, okay, if I'm not getting that from my food, how can I get these bases covered with supplementation? So in seasons like my first trimester where I'm not eating super well, then I still have all these bases is covered for baby's development. One of the biggest things that stuck out to me was just the importance of choline and that's in eggs. And I don't really eat eggs my first trimester. So I was like, okay, I need to be supplementing with that outside of food. Um, anyway, so really recommend this book for pregnancy and also just women's health in general. This is gonna be a great book. I don't know if you can count this as a book, but it's the 1689 Baptist, London Baptist Confession in the form of a book. So, you know, it's kind of like a book. And this is something that we've been going over every week at Father Son Ministry for the entire year. And I find this so helpful, whether or not you're like, oh, I'm a confessional Christian. I mean, our church isn't, you know, technically like a confessional uh, Christian church, but you read the 1689 London Baptist Confession. And I mean, just, I think the average Christian would be like, wow, I align with all of this. And it's so helpful to see it laid out in a very succinct and practical way with scriptural references to it. So again, whether or not you call yourself a confessional Christian or you're a 1689 or you're West, you know, Westminster confession person, reading the confessions and seeing how men of faith have gone through just painful, painstakingly, you know, rigorous work to put together the doctrine of the Trinity or the deity of Jesus Christ or the doctrine of salvation and, and going through all the doctrines of the Christian faith and having biblical passages to really support them and to articulate them is so helpful. So I found this really helpful and it's really fun to do it with my boys at Father Son Ministry every week. Yeah, our six-year-old came home the other night and he goes, we've been doing doctrine for over a year. <laughs> Okay, so Dracula. So this is one of the books that we we had this Easton Press subscription for the last year that I got for Elisha's birthday. And I've really enjoyed reading the books myself. 
these are just beautiful books you want on your shelf. And so I read this because it's a classic. Not knowing, I knew like Dracula, I've never seen anything with Dracula in it, but I knew enough to know it's like a vampire figure, right? And so I was like, okay, this is a classic book. Well, it ended up being a little more horrific than anything I've ever read. I, I don't read things that are in the horror genre. And because, if this was a 21st century writing, there's no way I would have read this. Sure. You know, but anytime something is classic and it's older, it's written a little bit more behind a veil or with thicker language that's more difficult to figure out and it's not just as, as in your face. But there were a couple things in here where I was like, I don't know if I can get through this. Wow. It was very captivating though. And I'd, I'd highly recommend it, honestly. It was, a, it was a really thrilling read and you really got sucked into the mystery of all of it. So even though this isn't like my typical go-to for a read, it was a, a pretty interesting fiction book. Awesome. Katie mentioned that we both got a free day in this last quarter, and this was a book I picked up on my free day. I walked to a little bookstore, and this one just popped out to me. Well, first off, it looked like a doable read within a day. I'm a slow reader, so I needed something kind of small. Um, but The Stranger by Albert, I think you say it, Camus. Uh, he's a French philosopher, and he wrote this book. Really, it's a first. It's from the first person perspective. Um, I'm not gonna go into like the whole plot, but basically, it's a very existential book. Like, what is the meaning of anything? And there's a religious undertone, and really, he's he's an atheist, but in my mind, I feel like the religious perspectives in this book come out looking pretty good, you know, even though I don't think that was his intention, because even the author's, you know, an atheist. Um, so anyways, really enjoy, it was a good, coming off of like Don Quixote and taking a break from that to read this, because Don Quixote, you know, was written, I think like in 1608, then reading something that was written in 1940 was like such a breath of fresh air. It's like, man, this feels like junk food. I can just plow through this. So anyways, enjoyable read, The Stranger by Albert Camus. Elisha always has to look up the author's last names because you, they're always like foreign or hard to pronounce. Yeah, I would have said Camus. That's like, what I would have said when you said Camus. I was I'm like, glad wow. I checked. Yeah, that's how, that's what they said on Google was Camus. Yeah, I typically just, this one's by A.J. Harper. <laughs> so points for me for being able to pronounce your last name. Okay, this was my free day read. Went to the same little bookstore and this is write a must read. So, you know, it's been a dream of mine since I was like, Ten to write a book and it started out as a fiction book and I'd get like 14 chapters in these novels and stuff. Well, that's quite a few chapters. Yeah, I, I applied myself for hours and hours and hours. Um, never finished a manuscript and then now I feel like it's a joint desire of Elisha's and mine to write books one day. We love to read books and so I think we would love to write a book that was worth reading. And so yeah. that's why, I think that's the biggest fear I have is could we write a book that was worth reading? And so I love this book. Like if you're looking into writing a book, this is a phenomenal resource. She breaks everything down. And when we finally put a book out, you will know where we got all of our concepts from. Yeah. Well, I love that she differentiates between writing a must read versus writing a bestseller. Because yeah. we've all gone to the, you know, bestseller list, picked a book and read it and been very underwhelmed by it. And I think that's a huge reason we want, because we read so much, we don't, we've read many books that are like, meh, you yeah. know, like, Yeah, like okay. they don't change like, your life. Yeah. Like you want it to be a must read and so that someone is like, this is so good, you need to read this. Yes. Not like, okay, well they had all the right sales language so it sold a lot of copies, but right. it didn't actually impact someone. Yes, exactly. So anyways, that's a, that's a goal of ours. Speaking of a must read or impact book, oh. Atomic Habits, it's crazy because Katie and I, since we've been married, we've, you know, been self-help, you know, junkies really, just like <laughs> reading all the self-help books that we can get our hands on. and. Again, a lot of times those are, they, they, you'll be able to get a couple nuggets from them, but they kind of all start sounding the same to some extent. I, I know After they all. a few years, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're great. I still love, you know, the compound effect or, you know, the. Well, that's a good one. The, there, for every like compound effect, there's like five like vanilla sure. self-help. Okay. So maybe that wasn't a good example. I still love the compound effect. <laughs> it's a great book. But Atomic Habits, you know, we first read this, what, four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And when we read it, we're like, boy, this one. This one, this it really, it really struck 
you know, accord with us. We read it again a couple years later and I pulled it out on my free day. And once again, and this is the great thing about finding a good book because we change as people, hopefully we're growing and we're moving and we're, you know, we're developing new skills and new ideas. We can read the same book and get totally different things out of it. And so I'm going through Atomic Habits again and I'm loving it and get, just couldn't recommend Atomic Habits enough. It's a great book. It's, yeah. a must, it's a must read in my mind. It is a must read. And hopefully a lot of you have already read it. Okay, we are what we eat. I got this during my free day and didn't actually end up getting to it because this write a must read was so appealing. Uh, but since then I have read this, it's really changed my perspective on just life in general. It's called a slow food manifesto. And it's talking about how going back to the slow is what makes things interesting for us and it's just the difference between a handcrafted meal or a tv dinner is that one does take a lot more work but it also fulfills us in the process where the other is a fast way to calories on the table but at the end we feel just empty and on to the next thing we aren't really like we're created to work and be creative and um find those things fulfilling. So anyways, this is just, I feel like a great life book more than just food. It's, it's a powerful book on perspective and slowing down our lives. I probably shouldn't be speaking to this one. Katie should be speaking to this one because I got like three or four chapters into this and then got distracted or bored or something. I don't know. So, okay, this is one that many people have recommended. It gets talked about quite a bit in the family, uh, books, Habits of the Household uh, by Justin Whitmill early. And I don't want to like throw shade on this guy because I think he's got great concepts in here, but maybe just something about the way he was writing this didn't captivate me. I, what do you have to say about this, Katie Babe? Yeah, so I think I just finished this and it's something where I think there was so much there. I love the pain points that he identifies in our homes because a lot of us with families, we have the same pain points of lack of rest or chaos or family meal times, uh, media, right? All these things, kids' sports, education. And so I love that he touches on all those things, but what I felt like was he was hesitant to really call you out to change your life. And I kind of like radical books. Like I want someone to shock me with what they're doing in their family and like surprise me. And so I'm like, really, that's possible to make that radical change. I want to do that too. And someone that like pulls me up from the norm and the average lifestyle I've fallen into. And I feel like he was a little scared to do that and to call out things for what they really were. And so it's just like, well, if you tweak this just a little tiny bit, then your life might be a little tiny better. And mm. it's like, I don't want just a little bit tiny better than average life. I really want a family that's exceptional. Mm. And so anyways, I feel like he kind of hit them, uh, missed the mark with his solution. That makes sense. Yeah, because like you said, the pain points are all there. And you're like, great, but I mean, we're looking for, let's get some radical ideas here. We're taking the time to read a book, you know, shake it up a bit. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So anyways, that's probably just like more our style, um, but we, we really wanted to be inspired to change and this didn't inspire any change in me. It just was kind of like, oh, you know. I think that's what, how, I, how I felt a few chapters in. Yeah. This is kind of funny. This is called Better Health with GNLD. It's, okay, the supplements we take are is are from the 60 year old company and this book was written like 40 years ago from wow. someone who was a distributor within the company and so it's basically this little manual to all of the supplements that we take and just kind of explaining the science behind them a little bit more and stuff like that i have this like very small portion of me that loves nerding out about supplements. And so this was a really fun read for me specifically. I can't say I recommend it to anyone. I don't even think it's being published, uh, but lots of things that are underlined for me in here. Okay. Understanding marriage and family, a Catholic perspective. So this was given to me by a Catholic friend. And of course I was skeptical because I'm not Catholic. And I was like, okay, well, I still want to get some tidbits. I love learning about family, anything regarding the family from, from anybody. And so I started this again, skeptical because I'm not Catholic, but boy, I tell you what, he breaks this into two sections. The first section really using natural law to, for a, for, to make a case for the family. And I know that's something that's common within the Catholic church is using 
using natural law. And it's not something that I naturally go to. I like looking at God's laws, the authority, and really leaning on that first and foremost. But then he breaks the second half into, into what he calls special revelation and revelation to defend the family. So I started this and I was pumped the way he was using natural law to make a case for the family. I was like, man, I was underlining a bunch of things. You just have such a high view of family. But then it's funny, the part that I thought I was gonna like the most, the special revelation part, um, I ended up not liking as much as the first part. And I think it's because of a lot of the Catholic perspective on the scriptures and then the high uh, value they put on church history and the authority of the church. And so what he calls special revelation wasn't what I was naturally thinking, you know, when he kind of gave me the premise of the book. So again, you know, again, we're not Catholic. If you're Catholic, this is probably, you probably love this book. If you're not Catholic, I would still recommend it because I think, think that first part is so inspirational. The picture he draws of the family and what it can do and what it has done throughout human history really got me fired up. And so again, I'd, I, I enjoyed reading this book. Okay, this is another one of those books we got from Easton Press. It's called Heart of Darkness. So me and my dark fiction reads over here this month. Um, it has these kind of bizarre illustrations that are painted on plywood. So oh. anyways, that's kind of interesting. What I love about these books is that they explain in the beginning a backstory for the author, a backstory for the illustrator, and I love that like extra perspective. Um, but this was basically about the ivory trade going down into the heart of Africa. I wouldn't recommend this book. It was it kind of reminded me of a book you would read in high school or college that they would be like, okay, so what does it mean? It's very poetic and thick and layered and he doesn't really say straight out what he's trying to say. So you get like through a page and then you're like, I think I missed something. I think I need to go back and read that page again because we are not talking about what I thought we were talking about. So it was like a good mental challenge. Yeah. Good, good mental challenge. Okay, this is one, I've not read the whole thing. It's How to Read a Book by, I think you say it, Mortimer J. Adler. Again, I didn't look this name up. I yeah. never see the authors. <laughs> this was originally written in 1940, and then there's this is a revised version written in 1963. But they just give you like this framework for how to read different books. So how to read history, how to read fiction, how to read philosophy, how to read poetry, and on and on and on. And it's really helpful. I think this was kind of coming out of the wake of the whole speed reading phenomenon, where it's like, just get, get through it, blow through it. And they're like, wait a second. like. Sure, that might be nice to be able to have that ability when the time's right to use your speed reading skills, but that's not how you should approach all, all you know, literature and all writing. And so they break down different ways to approach different styles of writing and different forms of writing. And I find it really helpful. So I view, that, I view this more of like a reference manual where you can like reference, okay, how should we approach, you know, again, how should I approach philosophy? How should I approach history? Does that make nice. sense? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I really enjoy reading it. I'm looking forward to reading that one when he has done. Okay, so this is kind of a funny thing. So the Tuckwise family, my dad had this on the bookshelf years ago and I saw it and it didn't really appeal to me because I just wanted as much tech as I could have at like 19. Um, and then what's funny is I've seen it mentioned and recommended dozens of times since then. And it took a gal that I follow who shares a different perspective than I do, than we do on screens. And she's very pro technology. And she recommended this book. She said that she read it and she didn't like it. And so I instantly ordered it. <laughs> that was the book review I needed. I was like, okay, well, we don't share the same perspective. So if she doesn't like it. Maybe there's something in there that I'm going to be inspired by. And fantastic. From my perspective, I loved this book. I love um, the concepts in there on work and rest, how we were created for rhythms of work and rest, and how in our culture we have traded those for toil and leisure. And so he talks about just the unfulfillment that we get when we toil and then leisure instead of rest and the big discrepancy between those things. I feel like he put a lot of language to things that I believe that I didn't have the language to communicate before. And so, I mean, this entire thing is just like marked up, <laughs> marked up yeah. and um, bent pages and everything because I want to get better at communicating um, in the way that he does. That is just so simple and profound and clear when it comes to tech. And I'm also, I really want to read the sequel to this because his daughter talks about 
growing up this way and then how she uses tech now in her adult life because that's something that we're really trying to navigate you know our six-year-old is like when are when are when am i going to get an iphone you know our six-year-old <laughs> we don't even have iphones in our home you know, and so I want to be able to pass on our value system in a way that doesn't turn him off from it. Obviously, we're, they're gonna think iPhones are cool. I'm, I'm not, Yeah. you know, but I don't wanna be like the lame parent either that forces your kid a certain direction because you're so hardcore differently. Yeah, another premise that he makes, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, Katie, because we've been talking about this as yeah. you've been reading it, is that you're not just removing something from your life, you're replacing it with something better and more fulfilling. And yes. I think that's the goal that Katie and I have with our children. It's not just like, ah, screens are bad. It's like, hey, what if we did this instead? And to find something that's really fulfilling for our kiddos that they find helpful and they feel accomplished in doing. Sorry, on the in the forward, I mean, this is what got me on the first page. TechWise parenting isn't simply intended to eliminate t technology, but to put better things in its place. And I do think that's kind of what we want to do as parents. Anytime we say our kids can't have something or participate in something is not just have there be a void there, but to put better things in their place. Yes. So anyways, great, great read if you're trying to eliminate tech in your homes. Okay, uh, real quick, another point he makes okay. <laughs> is just the whole joke about computer literacy. And like, well, we need our kids to grow up computer literate because they live in a tech saturated society. It's like, you guys, tech was designed to be easy. So yeah, if you're computer programming or something, that's that's creative, worthwhile work. Well, he even talks about how that's work. That's not yes. toil or leisure. Yeah, like that's like fulfilling work if you're programming and if you're developing, like if you're doing yeah. math, you're doing you're you're doing actual work. There's actual things with tech that are very worthwhile and that our kids can learn when they need to if they have a desire to. But like turning on an iPad or being on a computer, like that's designed to be incredibly simple. Yeah. There's an, it, it takes 30 minutes for a five-year-old to figure out how to operate an iPhone. So anyways, the whole computer literacy thing is just, they can learn it when they need it. I agree. Okay, soapbox over. Uh, here's my final book. I read this a while back, so it's kind of hard, but 10X is easier than 2X. Katie and I both, really like she already talked about just having our brains kind of broken where you're kind of like i had like i didn't even know that was possible i didn't know that you could do that when people just do extreme things with their with their lives and the 10x is easier than 2x is written as a business book by dan sullivan who's who's one of my business coaches and doc and dr benjamin hardy um and i find it so interesting just to see extreme stories but what something that i think is crucial and it's incumbent upon parents is when you read stories of success in business is you need to apply this to your home don't apply it just to your career don't just apply it to your health because when you're reading a story about somebody that has a crazy health transformation then odds are they made that their only thing like this is the only thing that matters to me and they lived that way do we want healthy lives absolutely do we want financially abundant lives absolutely but we want this in the context first and foremost of a thriving home. And so when I'm reading these 10X, like the 10X is too easier than 2X, yeah, sorry. I can't help but like wonder what the family situations are behind the scenes of all these stories. And I'm like, boy, I wonder how their marriage is, if they were, you know, dumping all that time into their business or if they were make, taking all these financial risks. Like, what was the tension like in the home? You know, they were, they were willing to live off of nothing for four years. Was that really actually a net win on the, on the overall home? And so as inspirational as some of these, you know, sports stories can be or business stories or whatever, it's like, man, I think as parents and as leaders of our home, we've got to be like, okay, how do we take these concepts and maximize our home and make our home abundant? And so that we can have just a thriving culture in our home where our kids are able to flourish and do the same thing, you know, duplicate that. So anyways, that was my little soapbox, I guess, huh? Yeah, I think that's good. I loved that book. Again, it like breaks your mind to what's possible. But then sometimes, Elisha and I, when we are discussing these things, we come back around to, well, sometimes for the family model, it's better to plod. Yes. Instead of getting there faster and have in your wake a bunch of wreckage, it's better to slowly and steadily progress towards something yes. instead of be racing towards it and have these crazy results. But what's success really? It's not just a dollar number. It's, yes. It's, it needs to be holistic. Yeah, people use this all the time in like talking about team and team building that, the quote that's like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, 
go as a team or go together. But I think about that even in regards to a family. People will be like, ah, oh, you know, kids are a hindrance towards like, towards what? Like your personal dreams, like this five-year goal you had or this 15-year goal you had. But when you look at the legacy that can come from your family, it is so far beyond anything you could do as an individual. And so to be able to go far, I think you have to first and foremost prioritize the family in the way God prioritizes it. And think generationally. Yes. Because you might go slower here yes. for our lifespan, but that ripple effect can be way more dramatic in the long run than us just hustling to get our 10x Yes. of whatever it is, um, and then having it end with our generation. Anyways, so thank you guys so much for watching that video. We were just saying before we started recording, we want more recommendations. Yeah. So if you have any, drop them below in the yes. comments because again, we love to read, but we like reading books that are recommended. We like yes. reading must reads, yes. you know, because I mean, even though we enjoy the process of reading, we'd rather it be a must read or just a great book. So yeah, like what's a book that's changed your life or that's totally like, giving you a totally different perspective, whether you agreed or dis disagreed with it. Yes. We wanna know what it is. Okay. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and we will see you next Thursday.